Thank you, Beth. It's a joy to see you in God's house this morning. Our service today centers around the strength that God gives us always, but especially in, in hard times. And that is the focus of our responsive reading this morning. Would you stand as we read responsively? The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you, good to welcome you into worship this morning. We are glad that you are here to worship with us on this day that the Lord has made. A couple of things to bring to your, your attention. If you look through your bulletin for the first time in a while, I don't have to come up here and tell you anything's being delayed, which is a good feeling. Um, we are on track and we are hopeful and we are praying fervently that everything will begin the first week of October. That will include our Wednesday night suppers. Um, it is crucial. I know it's been a while since we've had a Wednesday night supper. Um, so it is crucial that you let us know who is coming. We are trying to be good stewards, um, both of the amount of food we order, the amount of money that we're spending on that food, but we also are trying to do some things to make it a little, um, make everything a little safer for us, you know, have some folks serving. 
we need to be good stewards of those folks who we are asking to help out. So we really need you to sign up, let us know if you're not coming, do all those things we ask you to do. So we're giving you plenty of time. Wednesday night suppers will begin on August the, or October the 6th. Um, that is several weeks away. Lee's Barbecue will be catering our first meal. Um, you can sign up through noon on October 4th. Easiest thing to do is go ahead when the pew pads go by or call this week, get yourself, get yourself signed up so that you can, um, so that we can have you there. You can get ready as things finally begin to pick back up as we move into October. Another thing that is happening this month and moving towards October are deacon nominations. Um, nominations are ongoing. There is a box outside of Lucy's office um, in, the, in the office area. You'll also find a list of those eligible. So if you have not gotten to that, if you've got folks you need to call and make sure they're willing to accept a nomination, that sort of thing, please do that um, because those will run through September 30th and then the list will be published. We will vote in October. So that is coming up. Be in prayer for those who hold this important role of service leadership in the life of our church. It is a joy again to welcome you to worship this morning. We are excited to welcome Dr. David Hull back with us this morning. He was with us earlier in the summer. Obviously, many of you know him from his time here at First Baptist as pastor, and he begins this morning as our transition pastor. He'll be with us in this next season. Um, and I'm sure he'll have more to say about that, but it's a joy to welcome David here this morning and into this season of the life of our church. Would you join me in prayer as we continue in worship this morning? Father, how good it is to be in your house this day. Lord, we come here with all kinds of emotions pulling at us, with different distractions calling us in different directions. And so we pray this morning you would block all the difficulties and challenges and all that pulls us away from you. That in this hour and in this time, our focus might be on you, your love for us, your call to us, and the way we might live as your people. And so we ask that you meet us here in this moment. Bless this time. We pray it all in Christ's name.
Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'll give you a quick genealogy like you find in the Bible sometimes. I'm Anna Brink, daughter of Nancy and Carol Thompson, granddaughter of Emma and Joe Cothran and Cromer and Sally Thompson, mother to William and Dylan and wife of Jeff. So that kind of covers all of the bases. So you can see that my story and uh, my roots in First Baptist, First Baptist Church are well rooted here. Um, I have a script, and, but I don't do well with scripts, but I'm going to try to stay within my three to five minutes that Adair has given me here today. Um, when I told Adair that I would do this, this was a, the only Sunday that I thought that I could really stand up here and, and do this, you know, and give it justice, because part of my story at First Baptist Church from my earliest memories involves some member of the whole family. More often than not, it was Emily. Um, and it was us hiding and snaking through the, the pews and collecting the, the juice cups after um, we had any type of service and taking them over to the Hull's house after Sunday and then stacking, you know, cleaning them out, stacking them up after um, and, and spending the night. But some of my earliest memories are with the Hull family. So it, it seems fitting today that I stand and, and give um, a little piece of my First Baptist Church story as David returns to be our transitional pastor. It just seems to be, I told my husband Jeff, it seems to be a full circle moment today after 35 years. Um, some of my best memories with Emily, Emily and I are still best friends 35 years later. As a matter of fact, she has a daughter um, whose name is Annabelle. Um, and believe it or not, she's a bit of my namesake. Had the Lord blessed me with a girl, her name would have been Emily Elizabeth. So, you know, it, it doesn't end. Um, we were both each other's maids of honor in, in our wedding. So there are deep-seated roots um, to the holes in our time here in First Baptist Church. But a full circle, when you think of a full circle, it, it sort of seems like it's a, a beginning and an end. But... That's not what I mean by full circle. My story at First Baptist Church started long before I ever was born, and I hope it continues long after I'm gone. Um, and, and I think, you know, a circle by its definition is, is never ending. Um, my grandparents brought my parents into this church as, as young children and young adults. They met in the, in the town of Lawrence. They stood on this altar and got married. Um, they, they had their children, my brother and I, in this church. We were uh, baptized here. We both stood on this altar and got married to our spouses here. We all have the same pictures standing out front with our spouses. Um, some of my favorite childhood memories are GAs with Miss Alice Brown, you know, and and lock-ins with Tommy Cox, which I'm still not sure how in the world Tommy thought it was a good idea to have that many youth in a church locked in, playing capture the flag in the dark, which is why we don't do it anymore, youth, just so you know. Um, on the third floor, trying to find the flag in the dark. That's some of the scariest moments. Um, white, oak, white Oak music camps and and playing handbells and going to handbell festivals in Chicago. And then some of you got a taste of that a couple of years ago when Adair tried to make us all as adults try to relive what we played in Chicago. And we enjoyed it immensely, but we struggled. But you know, some of our, our greatest memories are of those. But what's woven in those memories are sitting between my four grandparents every Sunday and belting out hymns with my grandmother who, bless her heart, she loved to sing hymns, but some, most of the time they were on key. But my nanny loved to sing hymns. And when I would stand there and her favorite, our favorite song was, Oh, Victory in Jesus. And man, we just belted that out. Seeing my parents be active members in this church and continue to be active members in this church and sing in this choir. And then being able to see my children um, be dedicated here after Jeff and I stood up here on this altar and got married, standing next to Jeff when he got ordained as the deacon in this church, and um, seeing my children give their hearts to Christ and be baptized here, and be able to see my children enjoy the same things that I enjoyed as a child in this church. So that full circle moment just continues. And so I am, I am blessed to be on this full circle journey with all of you, 
I hope that this, this church, I hope your story, as you think of your story, whether you feel led to get up here and share it or not, I hope that you think that, that you will continue that full circle um, long after you leave this earth and, and go and, and live in heaven. But, but my circle started long before I was here, and I certainly hope it will, will continue long after I'm gone. Um, but I'm really blessed to be on this journey um, and this story with First Baptist Church. Thank you, Anna. I think it's interesting that Anna mentioned singing old hymns with her grandmother because when I started looking for songs and hymns about the strength that God gives us, the hymns I kept coming back to were some of the old, old hymns of our faith. So we're going to sing a medley of some old, old hymns. You just, just hang on and just <laughs> sing out. Would you stand and join us? Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, for the gift of this day, we give thanks. Father, we give thanks for this church family, for opportunities to share our stories and hear how those are intertwined. But most importantly, Father, we give you thanks for being able to come together in this place today and just simply worship and praise your name. And Father, as we prepare to give, we, may we remember that this is also an act of worship. And as we give, Father, we pray that you would use these tithes and offerings to spread the news of your incredible love 
throughout this community and in this world. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I invite you to join me as we say our prayers together. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, as the fog draped over the earth this morning like a warm blanket, so we pray that your goodness and mercy will drape over us right now, covering us, even as you promise that surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. So help us to experience these wonderful gifts that you have to give to us. As we gather for worship on this day, O oh God, some of us come with much to celebrate. This week was victorious. It was filled with good news. And we want to offer thanks to you. We want to praise your name for all of the good gifts. And we pray that this hour not pass without us saying thank you, without us offering to you the words of gratitude. Others of us, oh God, had a tough week. And so we come to this place seeking comfort, strength, peace. We come to lean on everlasting arms because we need to be held and held up. We all come to this place, oh God, having sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we confess our sins and ask that you forgive us, restore us into a right relationship with you, wash away the stain of our sin, and instead restore to us the joy of our salvation so that we may follow you more nearly and dearly and clearly this week as we seek to be followers of Jesus. Now, oh God, speak to us through your word. Teach us what you want us to know in this very moment. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It is a joy for me to stand right here. I am honored to be your transition pastor, even as I was honored 35 years ago to be called as your pastor. And Anna, you're, you're just right. There's some full circle stuff going on here, and it gives me great joy to be with you on this day and in the days to come. So it, 
it caused for me as a preacher um, a, a bit of a wonderment. Well, after all these years, where do you start? What do you preach with all of the, the good news that's here in Scripture? Where, where is a good beginning place after all of these years? I'm drawn to the Apostle Paul, who certainly is a, a model for how to be a, a pastor, a preacher. We read in Acts 18 that Paul went and began a church in Corinth. And then he stayed there about 18 months, but he left. But we know that Paul stayed in touch with that church in Corinth. There were letters that he wrote. We have two of them in our Bible. Scholars think there may have even been more that he had written. It was a great example of a pastor who fell in love with the church, and then even though he went away, he stayed in touch. He wrote these letters. He included some of his sermons in these letters. And so I have been drawn to 2 Corinthians, one of the later of the letters. After Paul had experienced life and ministry in other places, he offered words of hope, encouragement, challenge to the church he loved. So today and next week, think of these two sermons together, both from 2 Corinthians, as we listen to what God might say to us for the living of this day, right now. I'm going to read today from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll start with verse 1 because it it sets the tone for the chapter, and then I'll skip down to verse 7 and start reading there to the end of the chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Verse 7 then. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. And this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is is eternal. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
When Dr. William A. Jones, Jr. was pastor of the Bethany Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York area. He once greeted a woman in the hallway, like pastors will do, and asked how she was doing. And she replied with a a classic statement. She said back to him, Well, Pastor, I'm somewhere between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy. Is that something you know about? Are you maybe there right now? Somewhere between thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy mercy. It seemed like that's right where the Apostle Paul was. Did you listen to the words that he wrote as he was writing back, talking to the church that he loved from over all the years, speaking out of his experience since he had left them, he wrote back to them, and and he was somewhere in between, thank you, Jesus, and Lord, have mercy. Listen to the words. He said, we are hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, death, outwardly wasting away, momentary troubles. Woo! He could have said, Lord, have mercy. But in the very same passage, coming one right after the other, there is the Lord, have mercy statement, but then there is also this set of words. Right beside them, he said, but we are not crushed, not in despair, not abandoned, not destroyed. We have life. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And all of those words could be summed up by, thank you, Jesus. So, In this litany of wonder and woe, at the beginning of it and at the end, it's almost bookended by this phrase, we do not lose heart. He said that in in verse 1 of chapter 4 and also in verse 16. It's, It's almost like an opening statement. We don't lose heart. And then he talked about all the struggles as well as all the blessings. And then he wraps it up by saying, we do not lose heart. How is it that Paul could say that? After a life of of missionary journeys and hardships and struggles with uh, theological kinds of struggles and church struggles and government struggles with his life in danger, How could he say that? How could he have this kind of perseverance and endurance and resilience that allowed him to come back as an older man, a little gray hair on him, and say we do not lose heart? I want to know that secret, don't you? Because my guess is in these days, life is not easy. And for some of us, these are some of the hardest days of life that we might have known in a while. I want to know that that spirit about him, that faith about him that allows him to say, even in all of these challenges, God strengthens us in such a way that we do not lose heart. So what was his secret? And what can he teach us today? In case you are living somewhere between, thank you, Jesus, and Lord have mercy. Well, let's look closely at this passage and see what we can learn. Because in this passage, Paul is really preaching a sermon. After he shared this story, and I love how you all are sharing the stories of your faith. That's exactly what Paul was doing. He said, I'm, I've been through all of these hardships. He was telling his story. And then as soon as he gave testimony, he started preaching a sermon in verse 13. It is written, says, 
I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. It is written. Whenever you see that in the Bible, you can usually assume that he may be quoting from some other scripture. It is written, so he is saying, here's my text for the day. Here's my scripture passage. It is written, and probably in your Bible then it is in quotes. It is written in quotes. And his quote is, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Now, if you have a Bible that has notes, you know, down at the bottom or in the, in the middle, you'll see that he was quoting from Psalm 116, verse 10. And if you trace it back and look at that, it may not read exactly the same way in, in your Bible. Uh, Paul was, in all likelihood, quoting from the Greek translation of the, of the Hebrew Old Testament called the Septuagint. And there, it's the same same passage. So he's quoting and he's looking back to this great psalm, Psalm 116, where the psalmist is telling of the struggles of life and how this psalmist has known all these struggles, but how the strength of God has seen him through. And so that's the text for the Apostle Paul. He points them to that. It is written, I believe Therefore, I have spoken. The psalmist is talking about trusting in God. Trusting in God, I believe, believe and trust, same same thing. I trusted in God when it seemed like my life was just coming apart, when it seemed like I wasn't going to make it. I trusted in God, and God's power saw me through. So, Paul, reflecting on his testimony, his story of all his afflictions, as well as his hopefulness, he said, I'm able to say to you, we do not lose heart because of that same thing. But for Paul, there was something that the psalmist didn't even have. And he goes on in verse 14 to describe that. Paul goes on and writes, he's no longer quoting the psalm, now he's he's telling of his experience with Jesus. And he says, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. So here's the first lesson. The lesson that the apostle was trying to teach the church he loved, the lesson that we need to hear right now in our our lives. First lesson, we do not lose heart Because God is continuing to work for good. God is continuing to work for good. And just like the psalmist knew it and rejoiced in that back in in the older days, Paul is saying, even though I've had all of these struggles, I have seen how God is constantly working for good. And he goes on to describe um, the resurrection. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. So he talks about the resurrection of Jesus. We know what happened there, but he's not just talking about Jesus, he's saying that that same power of God that caused Jesus to get up from the dead That same power is available for us now. And in our afflictions and persecutions, we are not crushed because we have this power of God constantly doing good in our lives. That's good news. That's the good news that says we do not lose heart. 
That's the good news that Paul in another place in Romans 8, 28 wrote about. You know that passage, don't you? Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purpose in all things. That means in the good things and the bad things, in the the holy things and the things that aren't so holy, in all things, this God who still lives comes and brings this resurrection power that rose Jesus from the dead and can enter into our lives to allow us to not be crushed, not be overwhelmed, and can strengthen us so we do not lose heart. A few years back, there was a well-known pastoral counselor, chaplain, author named Myron Madden. He had a great one line that says, the essence of despair is relegating God solely to the past. The essence of despair is relegating God solely to the past. Now, sometimes we do that, don't we? We may read the Bible, and it sounds like it was so long ago, 2,000, 3,000, you know, a lot of years ago. We, we read the Bible, and we believe what it says. We believe that God caused Jesus to be raised up And we believe in the resurrection. The problem is we just put that in the past tense. It happened. It's what God did, you know. But Madden is saying, be careful now. The essence of despair is relegating God to the past. As if all of these great acts of God just happened yesterday. Just happened back in the Bible time. And what Paul is trying to teach the Corinthians, this church that he loved, he's saying to them, you remember how Jesus was raised from the dead, but that same God is raising you and me. That same God is coming with power to enter in to the challenges of our lives and cause us to have hope. And that's how we do not lose heart if we can understand that God was not just a God of yesterday and the past and history, that God is a God of today and will help you make it through school on Tuesday and make it through that meeting on Thursday and the tough conversation on Saturday. God is alive and well. And as as Paul was saying that God who is alive and well will come to us and will cause us to be raised up out of our struggles, out of our miseries. And don't you know that Paul experienced that himself? Through all of his hardships, he was able to know that this one who had raised Jesus was still alive and came to him and strengthened him. That's how we don't lose heart. Because God is constantly working for good in all things. Don't ever let go of Romans 8, 28, but link it to what he's teaching the Corinthians right here. We don't lose heart because in all things, in pandemic kind of things, in you you fill in your struggle. Fill it in right there. In whatever that is, God is working for good to them who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And that means God is working present tense, future tense, not just something great yesterday. Let's don't give in to the despair of relegating God only to the past. Let's focus on what God is doing right now and in the future. And hear these words, these hopeful words of Paul, so we do not lose heart. I love what the Christian preacher and author named Frederick Beatner says. He says, in God's economy, the worst things are not the last things. 
in God's economy, the worst things are not the last thing. So what was the worst thing? The worst thing was Calvary, when the, the perfect, sinless Son of God was nailed up to a tree and the world became dark and humanity was at its very worst. You don't get any worser than that. The worst thing, but in God's economy, the worst things are not the last things. And God made sure that as bad as Calvary was, that was not the last word that great, glorious Easter morning was. And so, a God who is always working for good, always taking the worst things and making sure they're not the last things, a God who is not just living in the past and doing things way back in the Bible, but a God who is in our lives and hearts and stories and church right now. We do not lose heart. Because God is constantly working for good. There's one more lesson I think Paul wants us to know. I think he was teaching the Corinthians this second lesson. The things that we do not see are more important than the things we do see. Look at how he ends up. Verse 18, last verse. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Now, that's not always easy to do. The easy thing is to fix our eyes on what we can see. And and we can look around us and we can see, you know, a pandemic that won't let go. And we can see division in our land that seems to be expanding. And we can see violence. We can see all of these things. We can look in our own lives and see that I didn't get a good diagnosis from the doctor or that I got a pink slip at work. We can see that my family seems to be crumbling. We see all of that. We see it in our lives. You turn on the news, you'll see it. You open up social media, you'll see it. There's so much we can see that could be discouraging. But did you, did you hear what? Paul was writing, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is unseen? Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What is unseen? We do not lose heart because we focus on the things that are unseen like the power of God's Spirit living within us, the presence of God's love, the wonder of God's peace, the delight of God's joy, the strength of God's hope, the the fog-like blanket of God's goodness and mercy. All of those things we might not see, like you can see all the other stuff, But Paul is saying we don't lose hope because we focus our attention on the things that matter most. Because he said those things we don't see, love and peace and joy, that's eternal. And these other things are temporary. So why do we focus all of our attention and and get so worried about everything we see Paul is saying, let's focus on what we don't see and be lifted by hope so that we can say, we do not lose heart. A little boy loved to go to the beach. I do. I guess most of you do. Every day, he would build a sandcastle at the beach. And every day just when he had it just about ready, a group of bigger boys, bully kind of boys, they came along 
And they saw his sandcastle that was all fashioned up and they thought they would have fun. And they came along and kicked down his sandcastle just when he had it perfect. And he was so discouraged and he thought, what can I do against these guys? And he built another one the next day and they came along just about the same time and kicked down his sandcastle. And then one day, after several days, on his way to the beach, the little boy passed a construction site. And at that construction site, he saw a jagged piece of concrete block. And he got an idea. And he put that concrete block down first and began to build his sandcastle around it. And just waited for those barefooted bully boys to come along and kick one last time to try to destroy his sandcastle. You couldn't see that, but it was in there giving strength. It was the solid rock upon which he was able to build his sandcastle. And that's exactly the message that God is always giving to us, that Paul was giving to the church he loved. That's the good news right there. The good news, as it says, if you're living in between, you know, thank you, Jesus, and Lord, have mercy. If you're right there, pay attention. Because it's right there that God comes to give us hope. And this hope is so that we can say we do not lose heart as we focus our eyes on that solid rock, the things that are not seen, but the things that strengthen us and that allow us to echo today, tomorrow, and in the days to come, we do not lose heart. Amen. Pray with me about that. Dear God, it is so easy to lose heart, to get discouraged, to be overwhelmed and overcome. But we are grateful to learn from this good apostle as he taught a church long ago through the power of your word, may these words teach us today. And so, strengthen us that we may stand on the solid rock and build our lives on the things that are not seen, but that are eternal. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there a decision that you are ready to make that you would love to share with this dear church? If so, we're going to sing hymn number 406, The Solid Rock, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. And as we sing, if you're ready to move your membership into this church, would you come to the front? If you're ready to profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Savior, would you come? Tommy will be right here at the front to receive you. Let's stand, let's sing, I invite you to come.
please be seated for just a moment. I want to introduce you to a new friend of mine. Dale, if you'd come up. This is Dale Byerly. Dale moved to Martha Franks about two months ago um, from Indiana and moved to Lawrence from Indiana. I haven't asked him yet why in the world he did that, but I think I know. Uh, he came here to be closer to his daughter, Lori Munden, who is singing in our choir this morning. One thing that I have noticed in the past couple of months about Dale is that Dale is not one who has just kind of sat back. Dale has gotten involved in this church in a lot of different ways. He got involved in the Rouse Baraka Kaiser class and has been attending that class steadily. He has also been a part of our golf fellowships and I've been able to get to know him during those times. Uh, he's also planning on going to the uh, senior adult retreat in a couple of weeks. Uh, he stopped by my office the other day and asked me what the dress code for the senior adult retreat was. And I, I told him I didn't know, and he said, well, do I need to bring a suit and a tie? And I said, if you have to wear a suit and a tie on a retreat, I wouldn't go. <laughs> but he's got a great sense of humor, and I have loved getting to know Dale. And Dale comes this morning on statement to join into the fellowship of this church. And if you support this decision of Dale's this morning, would you let it be known by a great big First Baptist, amen. 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 Dale, that's just a way of us saying welcome, and we're so glad to have you at our church. We're going to ask you to stand down front. Uh, Laurie, if you could come stand with him and uh, just come by and meet Dale and, and welcome him to our church today. What a great blessing it's been today as David has come and shared. And I want to say, David, welcome back. It's good to see you again, and I look forward to the time ahead uh, as we continue to serve together. But I want to ask now that David would come and lead us in our benediction as we close in our time of worship today. Thank you. And Dale, welcome. Welcome. You. All right. Would you stand for our benediction? As we leave this place, you go into a world filled with challenges, opportunities. But as you go, Christ, go before you to prepare a way of service. Christ, go behind you to gather up all of your efforts for his glory. Christ, go beside you as the leader and guide. Christ, go within you as comfort and stay. Christ, go beneath you to uphold with everlasting arms. Christ, go above you to reign as Lord supreme. Amen. Amen. 